Ladies, it's David McGillivray here, horror icon and a comedy legend, and I'm here with the first episode of Little Did You Know, The Chat Show, and this is a series in which I talk to people I find interesting, and I hope you agree. I will be joined in the ensuing weeks by guests, but today is a one-man show and I'm going to reveal the reason for that in just a moment. But first, um, we have to talk about um, Patreon or Patreon, however you describe it, because there are some of you out there, maybe, who feel generous enough to give us a few coppers. I'm talking about mere pittances just to help us to keep going. And I think there's a link appearing down here now is there to take you to patreon with more information i don't want to use the word tear because it does strike terror into our hearts now but i have to say nevertheless that there are various tiers of subscription um if you go to patreon and and the more you pay the more gifts and goodies and surprises you get and um, uh, they will include um, a free copy of my anti-censorship magazine, Scapegoat. Now, I'm going to mention that again um, today because I'm going to be talking about censorship. I thought that some of you might wonder what I'm doing here on YouTube, so kindly hosted by uh, Peccadillo Pictures. and. Uh, well, I can tell you, um, and the reason is, it's censorship. So, um, some of you may have seen the, uh, the trailer for this series, which uh, suggests that I've constantly been stopped from uh, saying what I feel and writing what I want. It's basically true. It's been basically true for my entire life, but we can come right up to date. Uh, right now because I was working for a video sharing a platform called Likey, L-I-K-E-E, -E, uh, run by the people responsible for TikTok. Now if you go to uh, Likey and scroll down you'll see quite a lot of uh, attractive skimpily dressed young women, uh, many of whom are dancing and miming sometimes to sexually suggestive songs and this was something that the organizers of Likey weren't particularly happy about. Um, they wanted to broaden the appeal and suggest that Likey was of interest to, well, people like me. So they hired um, uh, about a couple of hundred, I think it was, people like me, people of different age groups and cultures from around the world, not just from Southeast Asia, where I think uh, Likey is based, and they got us to do shows. So for nearly a month, I would go out every day, it was hard work, I would go out every day and record on my phone a live chat show. I would just meet up. It was in the days when we could go out. Can't do that at the moment. Um, I would go out and meet a friend with my phone and we would just have a chat for an hour and that would be it. And I must say I was thoroughly enjoying it. You know, it's the sort of thing I like because I like talking to people. I like talking to you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, but then uh, I'd arranged to talk to an artist um, called Nicholas Granger-Taylor, a proper artist, you know, he'd been exhibited at the New York Met, and I went round to his studio, and I um, got my phone, and I pressed live, and I started the episode, and no sooner had I started it, and said I'm in the studio of artist Nicholas Granger-Taylor, than I was cut off, and a little box appeared on my phone, and it said, you have been banned from Likey for a year for transgressing community standards. Now, we had been warned uh, by this, um, about this, 
and, and told that our dress should not be immodest. But what I didn't know was behind my left shoulder, there was a painting of a nude woman. It was barely recognizable. Um, her, her breasts were almost invisible because there was a light shining onto them. However, the robot, and indeed it was a robot, recognized those breasts and cut me off and banned me. And I'm pretty sure that the same robot then dismissed my appeal. I was very angry indeed, uh, because those who know me know my feelings about censorship, particularly with regard to works of art. There's a lot of stuff going on these video platforms like um, Likey and in, indeed TikTok. There was an expose on BBC's Panorama um, not so long ago in which researchers um, wanted to subscribe uh, to TikTok and said, you know, I'm 14 and they were granted uh, access immediately, even though you're, you're supposed to be 18 uh, to join these platforms. And there, there, were, there were no checks in place. So, you know, they, they're dealing with very difficult things and they choose uh, to censor uh, a painting. So you get my point. Um, I was then contacted by um, the wonderful Tom Abel at uh, Peccadillo and said, why not move the show here? And that's why I'm here. So that's the story behind my appearance on YouTube. But I wanted to talk more uh, today about why censorship has uh, obsessed me for virtually all my life. Um, it started when I was a boy. I was at school. Um, I know that I was very anti-authority. That's, that's where it started. But as I got older and matured and researched censorship more, um, I just could not understand it. Um, it seemed to me to be ludicrous. And remember, I was growing up in the 1960s when uh, we had theatre censorship in those days and film censorship was the most stringent in the whole of Western Europe. And what made no sense was that uh, something, let's say a film or a book, or a play were, could be banned uh, in one year and then a few years later it could be allowed and I didn't understand how that was possible. Um, I remember uh, I think it was A. A. Gill who said if you want to be remembered as an idiot then try to ban something and of course it's absolutely true because we look back at the censorship of the past which seems to be so prudish and uh, so as an example of that you know the films that were passed probably cut with x certificates in the 1960s are now on tv in in the middle of the afternoon so how how can this be how can attitudes change if something is going to corrupt you then how can it corrupt you in one year but then not in another year it's the same piece of work so what happened when I was at school was that I was producing my own school magazine and um, the most popular feature in this magazine was a column in which we quoted the stupid things that teachers had said in class and uh, the teachers were not at all happy about this and eventually the assistant headmaster got involved and said if you're going to continue bringing out this magazine and you mention a teacher you have to bring me the piece that you're intending to print with the signature of the teacher signing it off and allowing it well i knew that was never going to happen teachers were not going to 
sign these things and say, yes, it's perfect, you're all right for you to print this, I would have no material. And so halfway through production of the last, what was to be the last issue of this magazine, I abandoned the whole thing. I just gave out the half-finished copies to my friends. And that's where the trouble began because the assistant headmaster saw the kids reading this forbidden magazine in the playground. Uh, before I knew what was happening, I was whisked into the headmaster's office and expelled. That was it. That was the end of my education. And I was a bit shocked. However, things were different in those days. It was very easy to get a job. And virtually within weeks, I'd got a job in the film business, which is what I'd always wanted to do. Um, and as you may or may not know, in the uh, 1970s, I got involved with a series of films, a genre then called exploitation, in which um, we delighted in uh, baiting the censors, the British Board of Film Censors, as it was in those days. I was working with uh, a director called Pete Walker and... Uh, we were of a like mind and we used to enjoy sitting down and coming up with ideas and wondering how much we could get away with. So in, in a sense, I was still behaving like a little boy, you know, trying to push the envelope constantly. And uh, sure enough, you know, as the years went by, we got away with more and more. And uh, if you've read um, Pete Walker's biography, you'll know that uh, he enjoyed this immensely as well. And the title of uh, the book is called uh, Making Mischief. And uh, that's what we were doing. We were very mischievous. And uh, I remember specifically in the case of my first film for Pete Walker House of Whipcord, um, there was a, a, a sensational display for this film outside the London Pavilion in um, Piccadilly, here in London. And uh, it was a picture of one of the stars, Sheila Keith, um, holding a whip. Um, the film was about, um, in part anyway, flagellation. And um, I went along to the distributor and uh, we were discussing how to get this film more publicity just before it opened and uh, there was at that time uh, a group of moralists called the festival of light they were very powerful mary whitehouse inevitably was involved but it, it included other people like you know cliff richard and people like that um, were on uh, days at uh, trafalgar square campaigning against filth and what we would do at uh, Miracle Films is that we would phone up these moralists and say um, there's this, this disgusting film is going to open at the London Pavilion there's an appalling poster above the cinema what I think you ought to do something about it and to our delight <laughs> one of these people was fooled and wrote a letter to the Daily Mail. <laughs> I quote this in my book and said, these degrading uh, displays of advertising surely should not be allowed. Marvellous publicity. And um, shortly afterwards, after the film opened, I was driving past the London Pavilion with Pete Walker and the queue went all the way around the block. Fun times, I have to say.